On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled Maternal Morbidity and Mortality. Together, we will make a difference. My name is Kelly Gibson, and I will be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Melanie Motz is the Senior Patient Safety Liaison with the Patient Safety Authority. She interacts with the patient safety officers and other various healthcare staff in the healthcare facilities across the eastern region of Pennsylvania in an effort to decrease patient harm. Dr. Elliot Main has directed the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative since its inception 12 years ago. Nationally, Dr. Main serves as the Implementation Director for the AIM Initiative, the National Multi-Organizational Project for the Reduction of Maternal Mortality, funded through the Maternal Child Health Bureau. Dr. Main is a clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He has authored multiple articles on maternal mortality, obstetric outcomes, and perinatal collaboratives. Robert Ferguson is the Chief Policy Officer for the Jewish Healthcare Foundation and its supporting organizations, the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative, Health Careers Futures, and the Women's Health Activist Movement Global. In addition to working on the Jewish Healthcare Foundation's policy priorities, he manages the Pennsylvania Perinatal Quality Collaborative, the Statewide Health Choices Patient-Centered Medical Home Learning Network, the Reinvesting in Health Initiative that tests perinatal bundled payment models, the Statewide Opioid, Opioid Use Disorders Centers of Excellence Learning Network with Pitt Peru, the Southwestern PA Contact Tracing Consortium, and the Pennsylvania Health Funders Collaborative. He also facilitates the Pennsylvania Community Health Worker Steering Group. Mel, I will turn the program over to you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you everybody for joining us today. This is a story about Kira Dixon Johnson. Kira is a vibrant woman who seemed to be in perpetual motion, racing cars and jet skis, piloting planes, splashing in the ocean with her firstborn Charles in her arms. She spoke five languages and started a chain of English language schools in China in the 2000s, then worked in the restaurant business in her native Atlanta. She fell in love with Charles Johnson IV from a prominent family of educators and civil rights lawyers. She was literally the closest thing I've ever met to Wonder Woman, her husband said. She was superhuman to me. Kira was six months pregnant with her son Langston when the couple moved to Los Angeles to pursue various business projects. She delivered a first child by emergency C-section and hoping to avoid another trauma, she chose doctors affiliated with one of the city's premier hospitals. The delivery was supposed to be a walk in the park, Charles said. But soon after a scheduled C-section, Kira, 39, began to hemorrhage. In Kira's case, her family contends the medical team delayed treatment too long. Her abdominal cavity filled with blood and she died 12 hours after giving birth. In today's webinar, I'm going to talk about Pennsylvania's trends and themes related to maternal morbidity and mortality as reported into our PACER system here in Pennsylvania. Dr. Main is gonna talk about some of the strategies California has implemented to decrease and sustain maternal mortality rates. And Robert Ferguson is gonna talk about uh, some of the initiatives um, Pennsylvania is moving forward with um, and also talk about the value of participating in their peri perinatal, perinatal quality collaborative. So according to the CDC, maternal mortality is rising in the United States and has been since the year 2000. In 2019, about 700 women died from pregnancy-related complications, with 60% of those deaths being preventable. From 2011 to 2015, 36% of deaths occurred during the acute phase of delivery or within one week after. 33% occurred one week to one year postpartum and another third during pregnancy. The leading causes of death include heart disease, stroke, severe bleeding, and infections. And black women are about three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related issues. So how does the CDC define pregnancy-related deaths? They define it as a death of a woman while pregnant or within one year of the end of pregnancy. So we're almost talking about a two-year time frame here um, from conception through pregnancy, during the acute phase of delivery, up until one year postpartum. So here you can see um, 
this is from the CDC, the number of pregnancy-related deaths per 100,000 live births every year um, in the United States, and you can see that there has been a steady increase. Here in Pennsylvania, in the past five years, from 2015 to 2019, uh, we've seen an increase in the reporting of maternal complications in our PACER system. And there could be several reasons for this. One, uh, there simply may be some more maternal complications occurring in the state of Pennsylvania, or it could simply be an increase in awareness in the reporting um, of these complications into our PACER's reporting system. How these events are reported into PACERS, this is uh, straight from our taxonomy or event type. Uh, they're re reported under complication of procedure treatment and test, treatment test under the subcategory maternal complications. And these are the different categories, uh, the sub subcategories of where these events can be reported. The top three events that are reported to us here um, at the Patient Safety Authority are highlighted in yellow here. Uh, the first one being the other uh, category, and primarily most of these consist of hemorrhages, uh, stat C sections, and rapid responses for various reasons. The second most reported event, maternal complication reported to us, is unanticipated blood transfusion, and the third is unplanned transfer to the ICU. So in the same time frame, um, in the past five years, from 2015 uh, to, through the end of 2019, there were 22 maternal deaths reported to us uh, through the PACER system. Um, and I think it's important to understand that we're only looking at maternal complications, um, uh, that specific event type in the acute care setting. Uh, so we only capture uh, really that acute phase of delivery and, um, you know, up to that one week postpartum. Um, and of those 22 deaths uh, that were reported to us during that time frame, eight um, were actually intrapartum fetal deaths. Uh, the causes for death, uh, some of them are unknown, um, and this is primarily because of the time sensitivity of reporting of serious events, or it, it could be. Um, serious events are required to be reported to um, the into the PACER system within 24 hours of confirmation. So these are events that cause harm to patients, uh, where there's unanticipated injury or death. Uh, and sometimes patient safety officers don't always have all of the information and, and causes of death within that time frame. Uh, we do highly encourage uh, facilities and patient safety officers to update the report, um, you know, if possible, when possible. Some of the other causes uh, were in regards to hemorrhage. Uh, there were some suspected amniotic fluid emboli, and there were a couple cardiac-related um, deaths here in Pennsylvania. In terms of themes and the analysis of looking at some of the PACERS reports, um, again, most PACERS reports surround the time of hospitalization and imminent birth, so we know that women die upwards of a year out from delivery. Um, but based upon what we've seen in the acute care phase, um, hemorrhage is what we most commonly see reported. Um, and this typically is because of lacerations, retained placenta, uterine atony. Um, you can see some of the treatments um, that have been identified in our analysis, uh, the brachy balloon surgery procedure. Um, some of the other things that we see um, from a complication standpoint, shoulder dystocia, uh, C-section delivery, stat C-section, and of course, preeclampsia and eclampsia. So before I talk, uh, turn it over to Dr. Main, I, I did want it to point out that in the fall of 2018, the Patient Safety Authority did put out a process measure survey um, to Pennsylvania hospitals, um, asking them about different process, process measures and different care areas. And we did touch on maternal mortality and um, you know what some of their efforts were to decrease morbidity and mortality. So as you can see here, of the respondents, 94% um, of respondents fully or partially implemented um, immediate access to hemorrhage prevention, medications, and supplies in obstetric locations. 83% identified and managed maternal hypertension. Um, about 60% established and used uh, a standard objective uh, to measure and determine postpartum blood loss. And just over half um, have a protocol to identify and treat maternal sepsis. So this kind of gives us a little bit of a pulse on, you know, what we're doing here in Pennsylvania uh, to fight this uh, maternal mortality battle. And
And now, Dr. Main, I will turn the presentation over to you. Good morning from here in California, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, full disclosure, I was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania for five years, so I'm pretty familiar with the goings on in the Quaker State. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk about some of the things that have happened around the country and in California. Over the last 15 years, we've seen a rise in maternal mortality in California, in the U.S., no matter how you measure it. There's several different ways. Uh, the National Center for Health Statistics used the WHO measure. Um, the CDC used the pregnancy-related mortality rate. Both have had a similar rise over this time period. It's the last 20 plus years. In concordance with that, it has been a doubling in the rate of severe maternal morbidity, which we'll talk about more, but that's the CDC measure of major complications. Same time period, we've seen a rise in cesarean births by 50% in the U.S. Uh, this has stabilized, but it has not uh, really fallen in the last few years. Uh, so I chair the Maternal Mortality Review Committee for the state of California for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and we were started because uh, our Department of Health saw the rise in maternal mortality in California, shown here in blue, that paralleled that of the United States, shown in red, uh, going from the late 1990s to the mid-2000s is almost uh, a 50%, 60% increase in both California and the U.S. California has one-eighth of all the births in the United States, about a half million a year. And so we have the largest number of maternal deaths in the United States. We'll come back to this slide later. Uh, maternal mortality is a small number, one to two per 10,000 or 10 to 20 per 100,000 as shown in those last graphs. Uh, we look at it more as the canary in the mine shaft, really identifying issues that need attention uh, out of proportion to their size. So the, causes of the major causes of maternal mortality are illustrated here. Uh, blood clots, infection or sepsis, hemorrhage and preeclampsia, each is about uh, 10 to 15 percent in study over study over study, whether you're looking at, at state data like California or the U.S. What is the biggest contributor uh, in the U.S. and California, in the U.K. and other developed countries is now cardiac disease. Uh, about so uh, at least uh, 35 to 40 percent of which is cardiomyopathy. So keep that in mind. So cardiac disease is the number one, but the ones that have the greatest preventability are hemorrhage and preeclampsia. Now, when you move to ICU admission, which is shorthand for a near miss, that's a tenfold higher frequency, one to two per thousand. And here, hemorrhage and preeclampsia are much more common contributors. And moving forward to the severe maternal morbidity, as defined by the CDC, which is somewhere running between 1.7 to 2% right now in the United States, or 1 to 2 per 100, now hemorrhage and preeclampsia dominate. Three quarters of severe maternal morbidity is those two causes. So hemorrhage and preeclampsia are the most preventable causes of maternal mortality. Uh, upwards of 80 to 90 percent preventable for those two causes. They're most the, the most common causes of your maternal morbidity, and they have on case review high rates of provider quality improvement opportunities. Things that we could have done or should have done that would have made a difference. When you do these reviews over and over again, you see themes that appear, and we've called these the three deadly Bs: denial and delay are present in many, many cases and account for the quality improvement opportunities. The third one has really become, come to the forefront and is one of the drivers for equity issues, including the Kira Johnson case that was presented at the beginning, which is dismissal, not listening to the patient, not responding to patient concerns. So denial, delay, and dismissal ends up being really important features, both of mortality as well as for morbidity. There's been a lot of press around maternal mortality over the last two years. A big series in USA Today that we'll mention a few times. Allison Young uh, was the lead author of this. And one of the series was about hospitals. 
Uh, and where hospitals here in a fairly uh, inflammatory way, say hospitals know how to protect mothers, they just aren't doing it. And this was in reference to the patient safety bundles. Uh, the Council on Patient Safety, uh, which is all the major professional organizations, has vetted a series of safety bundles under the auspices of ACOG. Uh, obstetric hemorrhage was the very first one. I have the honor of, of leading this project. Uh, they had, each bundle is a checklist of items and practices that every birthing site in the United States should have. It's not a national protocol, more or less it's saying you should have a protocol and you should have a, a variety of things in place to support that protocol, but it's not specifying the protocol. That's going to vary depending on local resources. They are structured, each, each bundle is structured in, in the following four for our format, readiness, every unit, prepare and schedule, uh, prepare and educate, recognition and prevention, things that you do for every patient upon admission or before the event, and the response is how you, you respond to the uh, uh, event, a hemorrhage or hypertension in terms of the team. And lastly, how are you learning? Uh, and what kind of measures and reports are you doing uh, for these particular issues? There are now a series of patient safety bundles to covering the major causes of maternal mortality, morbidity, hypertension, venous thromboembolism, safe reduction of cesarean birth, uh, obstetric care with opioid use. And we did have uh, put out an effort for racial and ethnic disparities, but we've since come to realize that this needs to be part of every single bundle rather than the bundle on its own. We'll come back to that at, at the end of our presentation. So what's in a hemorrhage safety bundle? Uh, every unit needs to have a hemorrhage cart, which has all the materials you need to handle the hemorrhage uh, that you can pull into a room. Rapid access to medications, uh, rapid response team, uh, blood bank protocols, et cetera. Uh, response, including the hemorrhage protocol with checklists and support programs for patients and families. Uh, what what let's look at now is how this has played out in prevention of severe maternal morbidity. This is a big study we did in California uh, where we looked at 99 hospitals covering almost 300,000 births a year uh, with introduction of the safety bundle. Uh, we had a control group shown here in orange or in salmon color uh, that we had rapid cycle data on, uh, but uh, 48 hospitals but they did not participate in the introduction of the hemorrhage safety bundle. The baseline uh, severe maternal morbidity rate per 100 hemorrhage cases was 22% uh, across the board, 28% uh, in, in the control group. <clears throat> six, after working on introduction for six months, we did a six month post assessment and can show that the, uh, the purple line that 20, there was a 20% reduction. And what was interesting is that those who had uh, working on it in their second year, actually they had worked on hemorrhage in a prior collaborative, now we're in the second go, actually had even greater response, almost 30% reduction and 15% in, in the people to, in the hospitals working on it, their first attempt, showing that practice makes perfect here. The control group not did not that did not introduce the bundle had a 1% reduction, not significant. Uh, the second most important bundle is around uh, the prevention of complications from preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders, of which the single most important piece is controlling severe elevated blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure is above 160 systolic. Systolic is equally important to diastolic here. 160 systolic or 110 diastolic are, are the underlying drivers for stroke, which is the major driver of death with preeclampsia. Uh, so the bundle has uh, a process measure for treatment of severe hypertension within 60 minutes. We really strive to treat it within 30 minutes, but it's in, in it's uh, it's kind of impressive the difficulties the hospital have even in treating blood pressure within 60 minutes. 
So our watchword simply for that whole bundle is treat the damn blood pressure. Uh, it's, it's surprising how, how many barriers there are. Also critically important in this is early follow-up after discharge. Uh, and the University of Pennsylvania has done some really innovative uh, approaches to uh, getting follow-up uh, even with cell phone documented blood pressures in the first days post-delivery. This is data from the Illinois Perinatal Quality Collaborative, whose, whose first big project was on preeclampsia. Uh, and their goal was 80% of women treated in under 60 minutes. Uh, and that's shown in the blue line. Um, they went from 40% of women treated up to 82% over the course of the collaborative. Uh, and, in, uh, and of interest is the uh, their secondary goal, which is to leave no hospital behind. What proportion of hospitals had 80% of women treated within 60 minutes? And they started off only 13% of their hospitals had 80% had of women treated. And by the end, they were up to 71%. They also were able to reduce uh, severe maternal morbidity by 40% during the same time period. Now, how as we have worked nationally, we've gotten a lot of partners, including now the Joint Commission. And the Joint Commission, as of uh, this year, has, is, has put into play new perinatal safety uh, standards, both for hemorrhage and for hypertension. And what they've done is to uh, essentially take the aimed structure measures for hypertension or for hemorrhage and translate them into Joint Commission standard speak. So they have, they have their own language for standards that they will use when they go to, uh, to do site visits for accreditations of hospitals. So when they come to uh, your hospital and, and go to your labor and delivery unit, they're gonna be looking to see if these standards for hypertension and hemorrhage are met. So this is, they're starting later this year. They got put off six months because of COVID uh, but this is online to happen at the end of this year, uh, so please pay attention to this one as well. So let's go back to maternal mortality. You saw California and the U.S. Uh, we've worked real hard uh, for our toolkits on hemorrhage and hypertension in particular, and now we're quite different than the trend in the United States, which has continued to rise, but we're now in the sevens. Uh, this is maternal mortality. Uh, which is 42 days of WHO measure. It's, the numbers are higher uh, for if you go out to a year, of course, but they've also trended down. Now, that's good news. The bad news is that we uh, had a reduction in all races, but we did not close the gap. We're still at three to four times higher uh, in black women than in white. Uh, and that's similar to the U.S. The U.S. has seen a rise in all races, except perhaps Asian Americans. Uh, in California, we saw a fall in all races, but we did not close that gap. The black to white ratio is still three to four times higher, and that's really uh, focused attention now, more recently on, on health equity and disparities. So I'm going to take a few moments to talk about that. Why do black women do so much worse? in a variety of measures. The usual explanations that I may have given and most doctors and nurses do is that black women have more obesity, hypertension, diabetes, more social disadvantages. In a sense, that's blaming the patient. But let's examine that a little bit more closely. What if we only look at black-white disparity in severe maternal morbidity, which is two times higher, uh, only among college graduates? And let's adjust for age, BMI, and other clinical and demographic factors. It's still two and a half, or 2.2 times higher in black uh, college-educated women than white college-educated women. And the real shocker is, if you look at the absolute rates, black women who went to college have almost twice the rate of severe maternal morbidity as white women who didn't even finish high school. Put that thing in. That's actually the same analysis can be done for maternal mortality. That black women who go to college do worse than white women who didn't finish high school. 
that really does bring the focus back on, on health equities, on, on structural racism, on, uh, on how we treat women, black women in particular, uh, during prenatal care and during labor and delivery. You know, the biases, both explicit and implicit, are, really, are real, and they're leading to some serious issues with our, our outcomes. So let me end by talking about state perinatal quality collaboratives. And I, I want to put a cautionary tale up because this is actually hard work. It's not just convening a group of stakeholders. It's not just by establishing a system of webinars like today, but it's really a focus on building the capacity to change culture and to drive systems change. So it's about collaborative learning, learning from each other about how to do how to implement. Implementation is always the hard part of quality improvement. It's easy to make a bundle. It's easy to make a protocol. It's how you implement it that's hard. Uh, you have to have rapid response data. You have to know where you're going and, and, and have data to track you along the way and to teach, to teach each, you know, all of our hospitals about quality improvement techniques, which may be present in some areas like ICUs, but it may be somewhat new to labor and delivery. Another site that I'd like to direct you to is USA Today uh, for maternal mortality. And what they did was to interview mothers who had near misses. Uh, it's always important to give numbers and data in combination with stories, because what actually motivates people to change is actually appealing to your heart, hearing the stories. These are two-minute videos. So they can be put into a, uh, a grand rounds or so forth. Uh, and there's some 26 of these from around the country. There's accretas, there's hemorrhages, there's severe preeclampsia and all the others. About two minutes and they all end with, I am one of the 50,000. That number is now 75,000 mothers who have severe maternal morbidity each year in the United States. These are very, very powerful. Don't make the mistake I did, which is to listen to all 26 of them one evening, uh, and it does move you to tears. But get, look at these videos, uh, Google USA Today, uh, uh, I am one of the 50,000 or maternal mortality. So thank you. Uh, uh, this is our staff in California, a uh, really powerful group of folks. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Robert Ferguson from the Pennsylvania Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Main. And as uh, Dr. Main um, indicated, uh, PQCs are in ne networks of teams that work together to identify what needs to be improved and to quickly adopt a best uh, practices in response to those improvement opportunities to achieve a common set of collective um, aims. In Pennsylvania, in um, early 2019, uh, became a state uh, that had a, a PQC. And the way that uh, Pennsylvania uh, created its PQC uh, uh, was by building on a large concerted effort across Pennsylvania that spanned um, over um, a five-year period uh, by the organizations listed um, on this slide uh, to uh, stand up a, a PQC in Pennsylvania. And the way that that occurred is that we began uh, by uh, building on those efforts, creating a, um, a large uh, multi-sector stakeholder group that became the PAPQC advisory group uh, that was um, a, a formally a kicked off in n n November of 2018. And then towards the um, end of that year and the beginning in early 2019, uh, the PAPQC uh, staffed a variety of uh, working groups that were uh, uh, chaired uh, by women's health provider uh, uh, leaders as as well as a neo as as well as neonatal uh, leaders across uh, Pennsylvania to uh, create a set of key interventions and a set of common metrics 
uh, that would then be rolled out um, across the participating uh, birth hospitals and NICUs and health plans in uh, Pennsylvania. And the Jewish um, Healthcare Foundation um, helped to facilitate that process, and we now um, house and administer uh, the Pennsylvania PQC on behalf of and in partnership uh, with all of those stakeholders and the partners across uh, Pennsylvania. And a PA PQC um, is also very much connected to the regional PQC uh, that exists in northeastern uh, Pennsylvania uh, that is staffed uh, by the Geisinger um, Health System. The um, overall uh, mission of the PA PQC is to help the birth hospitals and NICUs drive improvement and adopt um, standards of care uh, towards three main aims. And those aims are first to reduce uh, the rates and the disparities around maternal mortality. And then two, and related to that, to improve the identification of and care for uh, pregnant and postpartum women with opioid use uh, disorders, as well as opioid-exposed newborns. And the PAPKC um, has been uh, funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs uh, from uh, the creation of the PQC, as well as um, a local foundation in, in Pittsburgh called the um, Henry L. Hillman uh, Foundation. And the PQC has to continue to uh, grow, and we are very excited that it now includes 65 of the birth hospitals and NICUs in Pennsylvania that collectively re represent 87% of the live uh, births in Pennsylvania. And we were also very intentional from the beginning to not only um, have the hospitals create uh, teams that would be responsible for um, adopting those standards of care, but also to ask the um, health plans to create PAPTC teams as well so that the health plans can be working in collaboration uh, with, the, uh, 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 with the hospitals and the prenatal and the postpartum um, outpatient offices. So essentially, uh, what it means to be a PAPTC site is that one, uh, uh, you begin uh, by thinking about who needs to be on your team, um, who are your champions, who are going to engage your colleagues um, to uh, uh, create an, an organization-wide commitment and approach uh, to facilitating the adoption of these uh, key uh, um, interventions. And who else um, on your team um, should be um, at the table um, helping to roll out new quality improvement initiatives? Um, it, and that team is usually a very multidisciplinary team. And then once your uh, team is in place, uh, the PQC organizes quarterly uh, uh, learning sessions. Uh, these sessions are meant for your team members to go and gain tactical how-to information in terms of how to actually adopt these key interventions by learning from content experts and also by uh, learning from the on-the-ground work of your peers across uh, Pennsylvania. But to actually go back to your setting and organization to take action and to work with your team to adopt those key um, interventions, it's really important to have quality improvement coaching and assistance and support. So that's where uh, the PAPTC staff um, assigns a QI coach to each of your team um, who can guide um, who can guide your team through the uh, process of figuring out where to start, uh, where to begin, and, and how to best uh, uh, prioritize uh, to think about uh, uh, what quality improvement initiatives should your team launch initially. And then at the end of each month and at the end of each quarter, uh, we have the PA PQC hospitals uh, complete a round of surveys around each of those three goals that are meant to identify the improvements around the structural uh, uh, measures of the PQC. And then we also have a PAPQC data portal uh, where the participating sites submit uh, um, aggregate information in a 
standardized way around a common set of a process and outcome measures for each of the three goals of the PAPQC. And then once the data is submitted through the uh, data portal, uh, we also um, have a Tableau-based uh, dashboard that displays that information over time so you can see the um, impact of your quality improvement work and also how you compare to your peers. And that's uh, meant to help initiate a new round of the cycle where you go back to the uh, learning sessions and uh, learn uh, from your peers about how have they uh, been able to achieve um, a greater uh, um, improvement than uh, your uh, team has or uh, vice versa. Um, if your team is, is in the lead in making those improvements, and then they um, have a chance to, uh, uh, to talk about that how-to information. So this uh, slide goes into some greater detail about what we mean by uh, forming a team. In terms of what that team does, uh, they are essentially uh, um, helping to roll out the quality improvement approach. Uh, they use 30, 60, 90-day uh, plans uh, to figure out how to actually implement these uh, 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 protocols into the day-to-day -day operations of clinicians and the teams. And this is um, a picture of just what one of those uh, learning sessions uh, looked like uh, back when we were able to meet um, in person. Um, ever since uh, March, uh, we've been holding all of these sessions uh, virtually. And at each uh, session, um, uh, um, over 200 people attend uh, from all of those uh, partners and, and birth hospitals and NICUs and health plans. And we have received uh, very positive uh, feedback. And the one that is most meaningful to me is that um, almost everyone says that yes, it was a good use of time, and yes, it helped me identify how to work towards the PAPGC goals. Uh, because again, that is the sole um, intention of coming together and, and the learning from each other. And that's meant to help initiate these uh, PDSA cycles, and in other words, uh, making incremental adjustments towards your ideal goal and your ideal uh, future state um, uh, 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 conditions and workflows uh, that your team is working towards. And I mentioned uh, that the PAPQC has quality improvement uh, coaches. Uh, they are displayed and pictured on this uh, slide. And Karina Moran is the uh, coach um, associated with the Northeastern uh, PAPQC. So in terms of what um, has the PQC achieved uh, so far, uh, we are very excited that uh, within about uh, less than a year, um, over 100 quality improvement projects have been launched. And this slide it breaks down um, how those relate uh, to the different goals of the PAPQC. And in terms of those structural uh, measures that we monitor through the quarterly surveys, uh, we have um, seen improvements in the number of sites um, implementing key interventions such as validated self-report uh, screening tools uh, for substance misuse uh, uh, during uh, uh, pregnancy. And then in terms of improvements around neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, we have also seen uh, more sites adopt uh, standards of care for uh, non-pharmacologic uh, protocols as well as pharmacological uh, 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 protocols around neonatal abstinence syndrome. And specifically, the improvement around here um, hasn't been as great um, as it is on the OUD side, uh, uh, but that's simply because we only have asked this question twice, uh, meaning it's comparing um, October to December of last year to January and March of this year. So the time period um, is much uh, shorter in terms of this specific measure. And we are all, I'm also very excited that um, a lot of the sites um, have been able to uh, collect the uh, process and outcome data. That does take time because these uh, measures are not measures that um, hospitals uh, typically r report to um, organizations such as, as uh, the Joint Commission. They are measures such as uh, what percent of uh, deliveries and, and of pregnant um, individuals have been screened uh, for um, substance misuse, including opioid use uh, disorders. And the PAPQC um, 
uh, uh, because of that funding through DDAP, has been very fortunate that we've been able to um, award a $15,000 quality improvement awards uh, to a lot of the PAPTC birth hospitals. And those birth hospitals uh, that have received those quality improvement war, uh, um, awards, because they have completed certain milestones, um, have been able to use that funding to continue, the, to continue uh, uh, their quality improvement work even uh, further. And this is, um, slide also shows those, uh, those other quality improvement award sites and the different types of initiatives that they are uh, working on. And the very recently, within the past three months, the PAPTC um, initiated um, a pilot uh, to uh, figure out um, how to best um, implement and adopt one of the PAPTC's key interventions that are listed on the PAPTC's opioid use uh, disorder uh, set of key interventions. And that's around um, improving access to immediate postpartum uh, uh, LARC uh, through contraceptive care and the counseling. And uh, these three organizations, UPMC Horizon, St. Luke's Anderson Campus, and Geisinger uh, uh, Medical Center um, are involved in this um, initiative, and we plan to be able to uh, scale it uh, beginning in October of this year. So uh, just to take a, a, a deeper dive into those uh, a monthly and quarterly uh, process and outcome measures, uh, the next few slides includes a screenshot of those uh, different measures where people log in uh, to the data portal and they enter in that aggregate information. Um, so as I noted, uh, uh, we have measures around SUD screening, OUD diagnosis rates, um, and rates around, uh, 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 around the initiation of the medication-assisted treatment, as well as a postpartum uh, care uh, during the postpartum period for um, individuals with um, opioid use disorders. And then in terms of the uh, measurement set around neonatal abstinence syndrome, we are looking at things such as what percent of cases have been treated with a non-pharmacological uh, um, intervention and a, a pharmacological um, set, of, inter uh, set of, of interventions, as well as, a, as, a, as, a, as what percent um, have received a follow-up services at a discharge. And then the main um, outcome measure that we've looked at around neonatal abstinence syndrome is the median number of hospital days uh, for uh, the length of stay among uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome uh, cases. And in terms of that new initiative around uh, LARC, uh, we are also looking at uh, 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 what percent to desired immediate, post immediate postpartum LARC actually received a LARC during that immediate postpartum period. And just to show the improvements that have been made around one of the examples, SCD screening, we have seen significant improvements in terms of the sites being able to screen pregnant women for substance misuse. And if individuals are um, interested in joining a PTC, um, all of the uh, learning sessions are publicly available. Uh, we have the registration links on our website. Uh, we also post all of the content um, so that everyone is able to um, access it. Uh, and then to support that in-between work, uh, we, we also have a one-hour virtual sessions every month. Uh, these are very interactive, uh, where we look at the um, impact uh, that's been made based on the data and, and the surveys. And then we uh, do a deep dive into what are people actually doing that is uh, causing that impact and how can we learn from each other to support the PAPQC sites of work around quality improvement um, efforts. Uh, the PAPQC has also partnered with a lot of organizations to offer additional trainings. And the one I'd like to uh, call uh, people's attention to is that we've uh, partnered with um, ASAM and ACOG to host uh, a waiver trainings. Uh, those are on August 26th and September 30th. Um, so if you have a group of women's health providers who would like to be waivered, 
uh, they can re register online um, and complete that online uh, course. And also unique to the PAPQC, the PAPQC has a policy arm that uh, uh, monitors uh, what policy barriers are getting in the way of the um, of the birth hospitals and NICUs um, adopting these key interventions. And then we then activate the policy group to create recommendations with a public and a private partners uh, to break through those barriers. And, and as one example of what's been accomplished so far, uh, this group has created recommendations for how to create value-based payment models um, in Pennsylvania. And we will, will very likely see uh, new value-based uh, payment models being created uh, this year and next year directly in response uh, to those uh, recommendations. And that's meant to help support uh, the on-the-ground work uh, that all the PTC sites are doing. And then it, um, in terms of future directions, uh, we are very excited to be in, uh, launching a new initiative around improving maternal depression screening and follow-up, and also um, having a very concerted focus on reducing the racial disparities associated with that. And uh, we are beginning this work uh, through this uh, task force that's been launched uh, with uh, two uh, uh, co-chairs to create a change package around those two goals. Uh, we will also be organizing virtual community listening and planning sessions to get feedback on that change package and, and how we can collectively do a better job around these two goals. And then we will be rolling out that change package um, across um, the PQC sites uh, towards the end of this year. And then lastly, um, and in direct connection to Dr. Main's presentation, we are also um, in, in the process of applying to become an AIM state. Uh, through that work, uh, we will create a specific pathway uh, for the PQC sites uh, to uh, uh, work on adopting those bundles around um, hemorrhage or severe hypertension and the disparities bundles. So directly um, in relationship to Dr. Main's comment, the idea here is that we are applying the disparities a bundle to one of those clinical conditions. And we are in the process of, of figuring out if we should select hemorrhage or if we should select uh, severe um, hypertension. And then uh, this slide uh, mentions some of the OUD and NAS key interventions uh, that the PAPTC will continue to focus on uh, through uh, uh, September of next year uh, to build on and continue uh, the work that's already been accomplished around OUD and neonatal abstinence syndrome. So um, at this time, I will pause with the uh, presentation and I will um, hand it back to the uh, Patient Safety Authority. Thank you, Mel, Dr. Main, and Robert. There was a lot of great information that you have all shared with us. There was a question that came in, and I'm going to direct this to Dr. Main. Um, what are the countries that have sustained decreases in rates doing what we are not doing? And then maybe linking that to the AIM bundles, which are pretty comprehensive, how do you advise hospitals as where to start to make an impact and work on those AIM bundles? But it's always a little hard to compare different countries in what they're doing because countries are comprised of multiple provinces or states and then multiple hospitals. But clearly, uh, other countries, other Western European countries or Canada or Japan has a more organized healthcare system and more standardized approach to care. Uh, and they have uh, been working on it longer than we have. Uh, in terms of the comprehensive nature of the bundles, uh, it, it is an issue when you take a, a bundle off the shelf, it's sometimes hard to figure out where to start. Uh, and that's where the PTCs can be helpful. There are certain things that you want to do first. Uh, you always want to do things that are, are quick wins uh, that can make an impact right off the, off the bat. You know, and hemorrhage cart, for example, is an easy one uh, to get organized and do. And the two most important pieces of the hemorrhage bundle are the hemorrhage cart and having a standardized protocol that you not only teach about, but you drill on and then you review 
cases to see how well you did uh, uh, a post facto on. Uh, the other pieces will come along, uh, but I would start with those two. Uh, likewise, for hypertension, you want to start with really focusing on treating severe hypertension and working on discharge planning. Those are the two most critical pieces there, uh, uh, but they're, they're all the pieces are important. But you have to prioritize, uh, and uh, you build a team, first and foremost, uh, in your hospital, and, and by having the feedback of, of monthly data uh, and review of cases, you can keep enthusiasm up for your team uh, to do constant improvement because uh, it is it is uh, about continuous quality improvement here. Thank mm -hmm. you, Robert. I'm going to direct to you now. Um, how have states such as California developed rapid response systems, and then from there, maybe um, one of the uh, rapid response data systems? Excuse me. What, uh, th there was also a request from one of the participants that you resend the Tableau link to individuals? Yes, so um, I will send the, the, the PAPQC data page um, through the chat panel. And in terms of the uh, question about um, how have states such as California developed their rapid response uh, uh, data systems, I'll uh, defer that, that one to uh, Dr. Main. Can you repeat the question, I'm sorry? How have states developed rapid response data systems? Okay, sure. Each state has been a little bit different. It depends on the availability of data. We've been blessed in California because our State Department of Health has, uh, has agreed to release uh, preliminary birth certificate data de-identified uh, to our perinatal quality collaborative. And so we get feeds of birth certificates for every birth in California, you know, it's 500,000 a year, uh, every month, and it's a month old. And that's a foundation of data that you can build. Uh, we link to that hospital discharge diagnosis files that has all the ICD codes and the disposition for both mother and baby, uh, and that's available. And we have that for 96% of the births uh, within a month or two after delivery. Uh, other states uh, have been able to do that, including Florida and Ohio for their perinatal quality collaboratives. Uh, other states have been more shy about releasing preliminary de-identified data, but that's a huge, huge value add. And it's, it's a value to the vital records department because when you start using birth certificate data for quality improvement, uh, the data gets better. Uh, and better. So it's a quality improvement opportunity for birth certificate data. Uh, and we work with our Department of Health and do training for, for hospital staff around things that they've been missing and so forth. So to that, we then add, to that foundation, we then add uh, case review data on a selected basis so that the burden on an individual, any individual hospital is limited. Uh, and that has been a very popular source because we actually now can create metrics for hospitals for the Joint Commission, for uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for uh, LeapFrog, for many other places that are all after hospitals to generate metrics. Uh, so we do it all in one spot that can support QI, support the Perinatal Quality Collaborative, as well as these other initiatives. Uh, and that's, so that's really been a, a strong part of our project. Thank you. And, and I, I know you said something that was really striking to me, decreasing the burden on the facilities, because I think we always hear about the, all, the, all the things that facilities are working on and challenges and how do we prioritize. So decreasing the burden is, I think, something that I think a lot of facilities would appreciate hearing. No, that, that's been, that's an important uh, aspect to recognize is that chart review is a burden and you want to use it very sparingly. For example, in the hypertension bundle, uh, there's no way of getting around having to do chart reviews of severe cases with severe hypertension, but that's actually a pretty small number uh, when you get right down to it. So if you concentrate uh, uh, doing any chart reviews on cases that have a high yield, high value, 
uh, you can keep the burden at, at a really uh, uh, a limited uh, uh, manner, uh, but you still want to have some ability to to do overall pictures like severe maternal morbidity. Uh, we're actually working now uh, with the Joint Commission and CMS to to do a risk adjustment for severe maternal morbidity uh, and bring it down to the hospital level. It's a population level metric the way the CDC designed it, but there is, it is uh, driven in part by case mix. Uh, and so it's a value to be able to do case mix adjustments for that. And that's gonna be coming within a year. Even currently, we, we do it unrisk adjusted in California internally. It's not a public release measure, but we do it internally. And you can compare yourself to other like level hospitals. So level one versus level one, level two versus two, et cetera, all the way up to level four. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's a reasonable way of doing it until we get the, the well, full risk adjust. So we actually published a paper in September uh, obstetrics and gynecology about case mix adjustment. Uh, so that's coming uh, in, uh, pay attention to that, but that's, that's a, a much better outcome to be uh, used for uh, driving a quality collaborative than maternal mortality, because maternal mortality, again, is a very rare outcome. Uh, you know, if you're talking about one, one or two per 10,000 births, uh, even the state the size of Pennsylvania isn't going to have that many pregnancy-related mortalities uh, within a year, but it's going to have 100 times more severe maternal morbidity cases, again, 1.5 to 2 percent. So I would go with that. And again, uh, since you're interested in hemorrhage and hypertension, those are the two major drivers of severe maternal morbidity. Thank you very much. I I know that we have a question related to equity, and certainly you mentioned uh, inclusion of that into some of the pre-existing bundles. So how should we incorporate equity into bundle implementation? Well, I'll respond to that initially. And I think a Dr. Main's point at the beginning was exactly right, that we need to be incorporating this into how we uh, respond to um, any uh, type of issue, and just to offer some um, initial steps that could be taken across all uh, of these bundles. At the beginning, it's really important to have established systems to accurately uh, document race, ethnicity, and, and, a, and a language needs. And once that fundamental piece is in place, um, health systems uh, can then think about uh, um, how to build systems for reporting, uh, responding to, and um, acting on, uh, and acting on the racial disparities uh, that they will find once uh, that documentation is improved. And then a third, um, it's also about educating. Um, across the hospital and, and institution, um, about our racial disparities and the root causes, and also um, implicit bias toward uh, ratings. And then the PAPQC change package um, around this topic um, also includes some additional recommendations around involving a black communities and community-based organizations and the family members and community advocates in the process of making decisions about it and informing the quality improvement work uh, that the PAPQCD uh, teams are doing. And that's a really critical way to get that qualitative information and feedback and insights that will not show up in the quantitative data. And then uh, just to um, offer two additional uh, points around this, you're also thinking about um, including uh, patient self-reported tools, uh, such as the mother's autonomy in decision-making, as well as the mother's on respect index. And then lastly, uh, thinking about um, how to um, analyze uh, uh, policies in terms of whether they are facilitating or, or alleviating 
the racial disparities and implementing uh, um, hiring practices to increase the, the, the diversity of the workforce um, at the uh, I'm at the site. Thank you, Robert. And we are about out of time, but I do want to kind of hit touch on one other question because I know Robert and I have had some discussion about this, and I think it is very um, important to discuss here briefly. Um, during these learning collaboratives and with the QI support that you're providing, how do you support rural hospitals to ensure they are equally engaged? Yeah, so that's a great uh, question. And we, um, at the moment, um, have been supporting those rural hospitals in the same uh, way that we've been supporting all the um, hospitals and the PQC. And we are uh, looking for ways to better tailor the um, support uh, to those rural um, hospitals. I think uh, the first step is always uh, to really ensure that you um, have a, a team in place with clearly defined roles and standard work. And once that a core component is in place, the other work of the PQC, uh, which is all around the heart, which is improving quality uh, care, um, should flow uh, once that core team is in place. And uh, we have been thinking of ways to uh, better engage rural hospitals who may not have as many staff um, in, that, in that approach uh, to create a team and work efficiently a while uh, doing all the other work that they need to do in uh, smaller settings. Thank you, Robert. Our webinar will be ending, but I will just want to say thank you to our three speakers for um, an excellent uh, webinar and sharing all this wonderful information. Um, if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact us and we can certainly forward them to our speakers. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you. This concludes our webinar.